This is a great day, isn't it? This is a pastor's delight today. You never believe this, but the clock that usually hangs on the back wall, that big digital green thing, has given it up. And so, have fellowship as long as you want. And I'll feel so inclined as well. Well, I'm going to take my watch off, but that reminds me of a story where there were a couple people sitting in church. Every Sunday, the pastor used to take his watch off and he'd put it on the pulpit. The husband leaned over. He said, uh, oh, you see that? He took his watch off. I wonder what that means. And the wife looked over and said, not a thing. (laughs) If you have need for a Bible here uh, this morning, uh, please slip up your hand. They'll put a Bible in your hands this morning. And uh, as we go through the scriptures today, I trust that... The passage in which we'll be looking today will challenge all of our hearts. It's been a great week uh, this week. We've had uh, a lot of things going on here at Faith. Uh, Yesterday, uh, Jacob uh, C. and uh, Danielle Moritz uh, were wed here yesterday, so uh, that was exciting. A fine Christian couple really have a great testimony and a desire to serve the Lord together, so uh, that's a a real blessing. So they're off on their honeymoon, so you might pray pray for them. Uh, The Lord will bless them. Um, One thing that Steve mentioned this morning, and it's not in your bulletin anywhere, I believe, and it's also incorrect on the slide that you saw. So what is the chance for success here? Um, Tonight, the hymn sing, the potluck is 6.30. The slide said 6 o'clock, and like I said, I couldn't find it anywhere in my bulletin. So um, come at 6.30, ignore the time on the slide. You know, it's just stacked against you. But come should be a great time of fellowship and the opportunity to um, sing, give some testimony. So I trust it will be a blessing uh, to all of us here tonight. All right, well, this morning we are in 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2, and uh, if you recall, last Sunday we had a youth Sunday, it was a great time having the young people up here, and uh, it was just uh, a neat opportunity to actually go into a different passage of scripture. We went into an Old Testament passage, looked at the significance of Moses' staff and how God uh, took Moses and really utilized Moses um, in a special way, but it was all about the power and the glory of God. We come back here to 2 Thessalonians, and we're in 2 Thessalonians because the Apostle Paul is trying to clarify some things for the church at Thessalonica, some things that were very unsettling to them. The problem, it seems, is that they were under the impression uh, that the day of the Lord had already begun, and it was cause for a lot of consternation on their part. They were very concerned about that. They were very discouraged over it. And they obviously, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, were concerned because at that point in time, they weren't sure what was happening with those people who were passing away. And so we come to this passage of Scripture, and the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says uh, in verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, being the day of the Lord, preceding verse, will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. We mentioned last Sunday, or two Sundays ago when we were in this passage, that the word apostasy is actually a transliteration from another word, and it's uh, typical that it's done at times, uh, but it was always um, interpreted, uh, for the most part, departure. If we were to put it in there with a definite article, we would understand it would be the departure, And uh, my suspicion is that that is a reference to the event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which talks about the rapture of the church. Two things are going to happen before the day of the Lord begins. One is the rapture of the church, and the other is the man of lawlessness. Who's Who's that a reference to? The Antichrist, exactly, will be revealed. And he is the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself, the Bible says, against every so-called God or object of worship uh, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. This world is not going to morph into an atheistic setting. We are not going to see this world become uh, filled with atheists because that is not Satan's end goal. His end goal is actually be worshipped. And so you will find that there is creeping into this world world a steady influence of false worship which eventually will culminate in this one world leader being set upon a throne and there's no sense in sitting on a throne and 
calling yourself God unless people believe it and will come and worship you. But that's exactly what will happen. And so even though we see a, a nation adrift uh, 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 morally and spiritually, we recognize that this is all part of a spiritual attack that is being initiated by Satan himself. The Bible says here, as we pick it up in verse 6, where it says, And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. I'm going to divide this passage and not go any further than that verse this morning, biting off smaller pieces so that we can chew on them a little longer. Let's pray, shall we? Ask the Lord to bless the word of God this morning. Father, we thank you for your manifold blessings to us, Lord. It's so wonderful, Lord, to know that we have a relationship with our God through Jesus Christ. What joy it is, what assurance we have, and what promise there is. Father, there's truly an optimism among us as believers. We thank you, Father, for your love to us. We thank you for revealing yourself to us through the word of God. And we pray, Lord, that as we study the word of God this morning, it might uh, truly prove to be a blessing to our hearts. I pray this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, the title of the message is the impact of Christianity and uh, looking at the mystery of lawlessness and why the mystery of lawlessness does not succeed. When we are looking at this passage of scripture and picking this up in verse 6, he's very, very clear here. And he says, and you know what restrains him, and the him goes back to the object there being this man of lawlessness, what restrains him. And when Paul says this, he says this to the Thessalonians as if to say, you remember what I was talking about when I was with you before. This was not something that is actually new. He's just, in fact, reminding them of the reality of what's going on. In verse 5, he would say uh, there, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. It's interesting, it's curious as we look at this passage trying to figure this out, as we try to understand what exactly is Paul talking about. So the question today is what exactly is holding back the revelation of this mysterious person, this man of lawlessness? For the Bible would tell us that this lawlessness, this mystery of lawlessness is already at work. We look around the world today and we can see that there are certain things that are very, very concerning. And we look at the events that are taking place in the world today. We, we look at it and we all would agree that we see lawlessness and we see challenges everywhere as we look around. But one of the things that we oftentimes don't stop to think through is how the thoughts of the day are evolving it's interesting if you look back to some of the older preaching that was 75 years ago, and I wasn't around 75 years, but I remember as a young Christian going to church and hearing the preachers preach against modernism. How many of you remember hearing a preacher preach against modernism? All three of you. All right. Well, I used to hear it, and I really didn't know what modernism was. I really didn't... Uh, fully understand it. And so this morning, what I want to do is challenge you. And I know this is a challenge because this is the first service. And you guys just got out of bed. You haven't had that much coffee yet. But I want to challenge you this morning to stop and consider with me this mystery of lawlessness that is going on in the world today. And I know some of you are going to turn this off and you're going to say, I just, you know, this is over my head. I just don't want to pay attention to it. But I think we need to understand exactly what has happened. And then I promise to you at the end of this message, I will bring it around and make it intensely practical. And I'll leave you on a high note. I'll leave you positively encouraged here as you leave today. I want to start by just saying that I, I came across a couple of articles, and then I'm going to reference a book that I've been reading. But the, the, the interesting thing is, if you look back through history and you look at some of the philosophers and some of the things that are being spoken about, 
This mystery of iniquity has really been going on quite some time. In fact, back in 1991, a Canadian philosopher by the name of Charles Taylor spoke of the malaise of modernity. Remember modernism. You say, well, what is modernism? Modernism is kind of the rise of modern individualism. And it came at the cost of rejecting all other moral authorities. Modern freedom was won by, won by our breaking loose from older moral horizons. Uh, this required the toppling of all hierarchical authorities and their established moral orders. Taylor writes in his book, The Secular Age, he describes three successive sets of intellectual conditions. In the first, he is associated with the pre-modern age of antiquity and the medieval synthesis. It was impossible, he says, during that period of time not to believe. There was simply no intellectual alternative to theism in the West. In other words, there was a time in our nation's history when on a Sunday morning, everyone went to church because the general belief was that there was a God and that God was understood. And it was a monotheistic system, and we would look back to the Jewish system and say, they are also monotheistic, and so there was some commonality there, but our country was going in that direction, and it came with some moral absolutes. There was no alternative, he goes on in his book to say, no alternative set of explanations for the world and its operations or for moral order. There was a time when it was generally held that God created the heavens and the earth, that God is the one who's in control, that God is the one who sits upon the throne. And all that, he says, changed with the arrival of modernity. Now you're starting to understand why those pastors used to preach against modernism. You see, this was a huge challenge in the thinking of mankind. You say, well, what relativism is, is, how is that relative to me today? You and I are living in the wake of these challenges that have gone on within the intellectual elite and are now trickling down, right down to the very seats that we're sitting in. It changes with the arrival of modernity because in the modern age it became possible not to believe. Before that, it was expected that you would believe. Al Mohler writes, and he says, massive intellectual changes at the worldview level over the last 200 years set the stage for the revolution in which we currently find ourselves. We're living in times rightly, if rather awkwardly, described as the late modern age. Put that away in the back of your mind, would you? The late modern age. Pastors used to preach against modernism, and then there was what brought in was postmodernism. We're living in the postmodern time. But what is the postmodern age? Only 10, 15 years ago, postmodernism was being described as the age in which we lived, as if modernity had given way to something that's fundamentally new. However, postmodern age was declared to be basically a form of liberation. Moeller writes, he says, whereas the modern age announced itself as a secular liberation from a Christian authority that operated on claims of divine revelation, the postmodern age was proposed as a liberation from the great sec uh, secular authorities of reason and rationality. The postmodern age was claimed would liberate humanity by operating with an official incredulity toward all meta narratives. And we can get into to too much there point is, things have been changing rapidly. And secular humanism, that which is, when you think of the word secular, you think of that which is worldly, that which has nothing to do with the divine, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with Christ. That's the secular part of that. And then humanism, it's all about the inner human being. It's all about him. We are at the center of our world. Secular humanism has been uh, tearing up uh, the turf in the processes of men's minds now for over 75 years. Well, some things have been changing. How many have noticed that there is a culture revolution that is going on in the world today? Yeah, you see it, don't you? You realize it. it it's, it's real. It's fresh. A gentleman came up to me and he handed me a card a few weeks ago and he said, you need to get this book. It just had a title of a book on it. And uh, I don't even remember who handed that card to me. So if you handed that card to me, come and see me, would you? 
It's interesting to note, as I was reading this book, it's called One or Two, Seeing a World of Difference by Peter Jones. I would encourage you to pick this book up because it's within this book that he begins to to analyze where the world is today and where things are going. Where are things? What What is behind all of these shifts that we're seeing in the world today. I remind you here that our text in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 has spoken to the fact that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. George Bernard Shaw, a notable opponent of Christianity, the British playwright, said there is only one religion, though there are hundreds of versions of it. It's interesting if you go back through and you begin to chart some of the things that are are being spoken of. He was not talking about true Christianity. He was talking about those pagan religions. I came across in this article here, some New Agers described the age of Pisces, the Christian era, as a 2,000 year interlude between pre-Christian paganism and the pagan age of Aquarius. In other words, they're trying to define, you know, how does Christianity fit into the world? And they go before Christianity, and they look into the ancient religions. They look into uh, the religions that, frankly, our missionaries have gone to, to try to put an end to because we're going into pagan cultures, and we're seeking to give forth the truth. But They're relegating the 2,000 years of of Christianity to a time period which is up. It's over. It's done. As one Harvard professor recently exclaimed, the culture war is over. We won, he says. And now there's all kinds of discussion going on within academia how they're going to apply this victory. Are you going to be gracious to the losers or are you going to take a hardline stance comparing a hardline stance Uh, that the Allies took towards Japan and Germany. Can you imagine that type of discussion? Well, we look at the insidiousness of the past and what is going on. It's interesting that there was a philosophy that came about in the 17th century. That's a long time ago, isn't it? It was called the perennial philosophy. The perennial philosophy Uh, basically defines the the terms as a belief in a divine reality that's substantial to all things. This perennial philosophy was a term that was coined. It was picked up by uh, Adulis Huxley, who wrote The Brave New World, and maybe you've heard of that. He also penned the perennial philosophy, where the term is defined as a belief in that divine reality, but in the soul he sees something that's identical with the divine. And it's fascinating, but if you go back to uh, some writings that uh, took place um, back in the early 1900s, you could go back and you would see that this rise of pagan mysticism uh, is believed to hold all the religions together. This perennial philosophy is like an underground well, he says. An underground well that basically all the water gushes up and it feeds all of the other world religions out of this perennial philosophy. Many thinkers have been strongly influenced by the perennial philosophy, that there is something divine within all of us. And you begin to see how much this is impacting our world today. There's a lot of polls that are being done today, asking people, you know, what is your background religiously, and what do you think of organized religion, and what do you think of church, and would you call yourself a Christian? And it's amazing, but among millennials in our country, the biggest age group, you will find that there's really a disdain for church, there's a disdain for the Bible, there's a disdain for all these things. However, they would go on to say, when they're asked that particular question, do you consider yourself spiritual? The answer is absolutely yes, I'm spiritual. And so there's a spirituality that is abounding. But where is this spirituality actually being rooted? Houston Smith, great uh, religious syncretist, admits that Huxley's book, Perennial Philosophy, converted him from secular humanism to mysticism. 
Interesting. You see, what's going on in the world today is, is happening behind the scenes, but you need to pay attention and actually listen to some of the things that are being said in the world. He writes in this book on page 35, he says, one of the most surprising proponents of this philosophy is Prince Charles, British royal family. 2006, he addressed the conference, Tradition and Modernity, sponsored by the Sacred Web Journal, dedicated to applying, listen, traditional first principles to the modern world. Now, when you think of traditional, how many people here, when you hear this is traditional, you usually think, ah, that's safe. See, that, we do. We think, oh, it's traditional. When Prince Charles begins to talk about that which is traditional, he is looking at the age of the church, that 2,000 years, he is pushing that aside and he is saying traditional goes before that. Back to the ancient religions of the world. And so there's a huge rise in the interest, for instance, uh, in, in Native American religion. Do you see that today? Have you noticed that? It, it creeps in the television programs, it's in movies, it's all over the place, but it's, it's truly not without purpose and without design. This is what Prince Charles said. He said, traditionalists, he argues, are not unhappily stuck in the past, but they defend it. Because in the pre-modern world, remember, this is pre-modern world, so it's before Christianity. That's what he's trying to say. All civilizations were marked by the presence of the sacred. Charles believes that the perennial philosophy will restore the wisdom of ancient pagan religions to our spiritually starved world. Wow. Wow. What's so amazing is how this type of belief is coming out and it's walking right into the public square. It's not something that is, is hidden. And it's amazing as well to take note of the fact that's impacting Christianity as well. Christian emergence speak of a deep shift or the great emergence when a modified Christian gospel will emerge as part of the pagan program of spirituality, social justice, and human unity. Let me just read that again to you. Christian emergence. Christian emergence, kind of the leader of the Christian emergence movement here in the United States is a man by the name of Brian McLaren. Maybe you've heard of Brian McLaren. Brian McLaren, I, I had the opportunity to hear him speak. I didn't know him from Adam. I was at uh, a Vision New England thing uh, back in about 2005. I remember my favorite preacher preached after him. My favorite preacher was Joe Stoll. Joseph Stoll uh, was preaching. He gave a great message. It was phenomenal. But before Joseph Stoll, I had to sit through this message by this Brian McLaren. I thought to myself, whoa, he, he's a heretic. This was at a Christian conference for pastors. And I sat there and I thought to myself, wow. Is he out there on a limb or what? Let me read this again. Here's what's being spoken. Christian emergence speak of a deep shift or the great emergence when a modified Christian gospel. Now, there is always a problem when you modify the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? You're going to modify the gospel, and it will emerge as part of the pagan program of spirituality, social justice, and human unity. You see, what is in view here is a utopian world that is global and able to function at a much greater level than what is happening here. We would say biblically that the world is winding down, that this world is under the curse of sin, this planet is groaning under sin. And they would say, no, the opposite's true, it's not winding down, it's winding up. Wow, talk about a difference in perspective. You see, the worldview clash is very clear, he writes. The revealed religion of the Bible against the occultist perennial philosophy of religious naturalism. Biblical twoism clashes with esoteric spirituality, which claims both the democratic right to influence public policy and the ideological right to silence the traditional view as hate speech. You see, as the Christian worldview is marginalized, it is ancient paganism, not secular humanism, that rises to supplant it. 
The urgency to create a utopian planet is driven by prophecies of cataclysmic natural disasters like what you hear on the news with regard to, for instance, climate change. You see, this world, this planet has to exist. And so we have to do everything we can to protect it and keep it from harm. It's notable, he writes in here, the lie arrives in force at a moment when its opponents are severely weakened. He quotes this man, Jones, this Reverend Alan Jones. Alan Jones wrote, he said, for Jones, he says, belief in the biblical God has proved exhausting and destructive and exclusionary. He can't wait for a more generous and inclusive version of the old story to emerge. He believes mystical spirituality will unite the world's religions and its peoples. The syncretist cleric's favorite image is the baby Jesus in the lap of Buddha. Now you say to yourself, okay, that guy's a wacko. But I want you to know, Brian McLaren, a leader of the emergent church movement, says that Alan Jones is a pioneer in reimagining a Christian faith that emerges from authentic spirituality. I, what? His work stimulates and encourages me deeply, he says. Whew. If you're not familiar with the emergent church and that whole movement, you need to become familiarized with it because it is insidiously creeping in to churches across America, churches like this one. You've heard of labyrinths. They're a big deal right now. Al Mohler, I was hearing him speak one time, he says, yeah, he says, when I fly into Louisville, he says, go back to Southern Seminary, he said, I fly over this Christian quote unquote seminary, and he says, I fly over, and he says, I can see their labyrinth there. You ought to look into that. Prayer walks came out of the emergent church as well. You hear about prayer walks all the time in Baptist churches, Bible churches, community churches. What is at the root of those things? Stop and take a very close look because this is creeping in and in its form, it is very, very destructive. So here we live in a time where, where secular humanism is actually shifting gears and it's, and it's being replaced. Uh, everyone throughout the late 20th century would uh, thought to be atheistic and thoroughly secular, but instead uh, we see a, a sacrilegious or spirituality that is coming about, a new spirituality as they, they like to call it. And it's, it's all based on this perennial philosophy. You say, Pastor Kevin, I've never heard of this perennial philosophy before today. Look it up, check it out. I encourage you to buy this book. The old secularists, it's noted here, are converting. Listen to this. Former Marxist by the name of Havel, president of the Czech Republic, he now wants to lift the iron curtain of the spirit by discovering what all the religions have in common. The new sacred canopy is redemptive interfaith, and through this divine revolution will save the planet, he says. Now, he was replaced by another president. They've only had three presidents in the Czech Republic, but he was replaced by another gentleman who actually had a problem uh, with the European Union and wanted to get out of the European Union. You've heard all about Brexit this past week. I think it's a wonderful thing that Britain's gotten out of the European Union. I think the European Union is absolutely satanic. And this fellow that wanted to be, or was the president, second president of Czech Republic, said, you know, I don't believe in some of the things that are being taught, and they got rid of him. So the third fellow came in, and he's much, much more about this global utopia. How about Mikhail Gorbachev? We haven't heard of him for a long time, have we? Secular humanist, he was a Marxist, obviously. But he was a pure product of the atheistic Marxist system. But now he preaches a form of religious conversion. He calls for a new synthesis to incorporate democratic Christian and Buddhist values in a new version of the Ten Commandments that affirms the sense of oneness with nature and each other for the future planetary community. I couldn't make this up. I've spent all week digging around to see if this stuff is even true before I'd stand up here and tell you. It is, it is mind-boggling. He goes on and he says, before we leave Gorbachev, he says, let me introduce you to his South American avatar. He said, I spent a week teaching in uh, Bolivia. President Evo Morales, current president of Bolivia, by the way, announced plans to take over all three branches of government to bring about a totalitarian workers' utopia. Um, 
Morales used to be an atheistic Marxist. Now he is a shamanistic Marxist, reviving the ancient Bolivian animism of spirit worship. Now, if you were a kid growing up in the church, the only time you ever heard of animism was when a missionary came and spoke about animism and, how, and you heard all these stories about how terrible animism was, uh, the spirit worship and so forth. This is what this has become. He's insisting that the Andean paganism reflects the true soul of Bolivia. Now listen, a shadow cabinet of shamans help him decide public policy. One television commentator assured us that Morales will be energized by the gods and all the powers of the cosmos. You see the gloves are off, the lie has come in full force and it's claiming political power the eventual prize is planetary, religious, and political power is enormous, and the oneness are eager to grasp their pearl of greatest price, a humanly constructed, this worldly utopia. Now this book is titled, One or Two, and he distinguishes between the oneness and the twoists. The oneness believe that this world Everything in it is divine, including the planet, everything is. It's almost a form of pantheism, but this is what this new way of thinking is all about. The twoists, like me, I believe that there is the divine and there is, in other words, the creation and the creator, and we're separate. There is a God who is divine. I am not divine. I am privileged to be a child of his by faith but I am in no way divine. You see the difference? Oneness and twoists. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians here and let's take notes because now as we look at this world and we recognize and on and on with examples of people that you know, there's all types of people who are mentioned here uh, in this book and you can see where this philosophy is going. And, and I'm so amazed as I, I mentioned to you earlier that this is filtered in now to the public square. It's, it's not something that is in the ivory towers of Harvard and Yale and over there in the United Nations building and over in Europe with the European Union and, and these great thinkers uh, supposedly. This is coming to the marketplace. This is coming to where we live. And the problem for us is that we stand in opposition to the oneness theology. We become a problem for them. Notice with me here this passage of scripture as we bring this to bear. The mystery of lawlessness, he says in verse 7, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Whew. That's a mouthful, isn't it? But you know, that's worth studying, isn't it? Let's try to figure this out. There is one who is restraining the mystery of lawlessness. Who could that one person be? Well, the first person I thought of was Billy Graham. Then I thought, no, he's too old. He can't be restraining. And then I thought of some great Christians. And I thought, no, they can't be doing it either. I believe this is a reference here to the Holy Spirit of God. You see, the Holy Spirit of God is who is restraining evil in the world today. It's the Holy Spirit who is, is there and he's, he's holding back. The word there to restrain means literally to hold back. I remember uh, training our black lab. If I have a dog, the dog has to be obedient, okay? I can't deal with dogs that aren't obedient. You know what I'm saying? I know there's more disobedient dogs in the world than, than obedient dogs probably. I don't know. Maybe you have a good one. Our dog now just doesn't even hear what I say. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if it's deaf or if it just doesn't really care. But you can say here and it'll go where? And it'll just do its own thing. I mean, it just really doesn't care at all. And, and we inherited this dog, so it was beyond its training years. You know what they say, you can't teach a dog new tricks, right? I mean, that's just the way that is. Well, when we got our puppy, I decided, you know what, I'm going to teach this dog. And uh, we, I went through a whole bunch of things with it. And I was very surprised that it was pretty much a, a quick learner. But I like to be able to tell a dog uh, to come and have it come. Does that sound about right? I, I remember at a Thanksgiving dinner one time, uh, my mother's dog, which didn't listen to anything or anyone, uh, got out the front door somehow. 
And we were already sitting down there to eat the turkey dinner, and the dog escaped. And uh, my mother shrieked, and she hollered for my kids to go run after the dog, and they were young and athletic, and they could take off, and I just kept eating turkey. <laughs> my mother said, what if the dog gets hit by a car? And I just didn't even say a thing. So when I'm training this black lab, I decided, you know, I'm going to make sure that this dog understands the word stay. That's an important command, isn't it? So, so I would take a ball, and inbred in a lab is the ability to go and pursue, fetch, and bring back. You know what I mean? And, and I would say, here, and she would bring the ball right back, and I'd say, drop, and she would drop it. I mean, she was, she was good. So I could chuck that ball in the water, and she'd bring it back, and she'd shake, and I'd say, here, and she'd drop, drop it right now. Our dog now doesn't know what here means. She doesn't understand any of that. In fact, half the time, she just runs down, sniffs the ball, and then I have to go get it, and I retrieve it. <laughs> but Biscuit was a good retriever, and I would tell Biscuit, now stay. And it got so that I could throw food out there, and the dog would, would stay. But I'll tell you, that dog was anxious. You could see every muscle in her shoulders as they would go back and forth, and she just wanted it, and I'd go, go, and she'd go, and she'd pick that thing up. And I'll tell you what, she was a great dog. And she was just held back by that desire to obey. I want you to think of sin in the world today. The mystery of lawlessness is, is charging forward, but it can't progress to the point where Satan reveals the one world leader. One thing we should understand is that Satan would love to reveal the one world leader this afternoon. Make no mistake about it. And the reason he can't do that is because the Holy Spirit of God is restraining him, holding him back. And so there is the devil. He wants to get going with his plans. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to have the Antichrist there in Jerusalem, sitting at the seat of God, being worshipped by mankind. And yet, God says, no, I'm holding you back. Take your Bibles and go over with me to the book of John chapter 16. I love that that clock is not there. I hope they ship it back through the Panama Canal. <laughs> in John chapter 16 and verse 9, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says there at verse 8, he says, And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. There's three aspects here that are worth understanding. There's a threefold revelation which the Spirit is giving to the world today. Let's just take a, a second to look at that, because there are three persons here that are being spoken of as I was reading that. The three persons are, number one, man, and his relationship to himself, to Christ, and to Satan. There's Jesus Christ, who is the second one. He is the one who is righteous. He is in relationship to himself, and to man, and to Satan. And then the third is Satan. He's in relationship, obviously, to himself, and to man, and to Christ. Man's in relationship to the three. Man's relationship to his self is that he is a sinner. We're all sinners. We are born with a sin nature. There's none righteous, no, not one. In our relationship then to Christ, we understand that we are a sinner for whom we have the payment of sin in the person of Jesus Christ, and we have procured that salvation by faith in Jesus. And our relationship to Satan is that in our unregenerate form, we are truly a slave to the prince of this world, but when we place our faith in Jesus, his from his power we have been set free, and this prince has been defeated. And Christ, in his relationship to the three, Christ in relationship to himself is that he is righteous, for he said, I go to the Father. His relationship to man is that of Savior, and therefore, man's sin consists of a refusal to believe in him. Christ's relationship to Satan is that of conqueror. For the prince of this world has been, you'll notice the past tense there in verse 11, has been judged. Satan in his relationship to, to the three, Satan concerning himself, is conquered. He's, he's been judged. He's also powerless concerning man. He's, he's been conquered. 
Um, he's been judged and therefore can no longer claim man's service. Concerning Christ, he's conquered because he has been judged and therefore even he has to own him, Jesus, as king. And there's no other outlook for that evil. You see, what God is doing is God is allowing the Holy Spirit of God to make clear these realities in the world in which we live. And so it is God who, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is holding back sin. Take your Bibles and go over with me to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, we're told here that truly we are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The Holy Spirit of God is convicting men of sin. And even though men may feel today with this latest philosophy and going back even to modernism and, and postmodernism and now this late modern age, man may feel like he is liberated, like he is free from the entanglements of moral absolutes. And so we have this moral relativism today, you know all about that. And so man feels like he has somehow been emancipated, but the reality is that the Holy Spirit of God still exists in the world convicting men of sin. You can make all the laws favoring all types of immoral perversions that you want to make, but you still have the Holy Spirit of God who's operating on the one true law, which is the law of Almighty God, which is pure and righteous. And that drives sinful men crazy. And because of that, you become an enemy. Because the Bible says here that we're to be a light of the world that people might be able to see what? Our preaching? See our righteousness? Well, if it's part of good works. It, you see, even just obeying the Lord as a Christian brings tremendous conviction on a world bent on pleasing themselves. And it's powerful, it's convicting. So when you do those things that are right, whether it's a Christian group that's digging wells and providing the gospel, or it's building a hospital, or it's a mercy ships uh, type of scenario where there's a ship that's performing surgeries for people, whatever it may be that is good, the world hates and hates and hates. You see, we're called upon to be this light in this world. Go back with me to 2 Thessalonians so that we understand what's happening here in verse six, and he says, and you know what restrains him now. And we would say that that is the Holy Spirit, so that in his time he will be revealed. And it is God who is orchestrating that. It's God who knows when that time is. It's God who will allow this mystery of lawlessness that's already working to be exposed. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Hmm. Let me ask you a question this morning. Where is it that the Holy Spirit of God resides? In the Christian's heart. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. We're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, which is Christ. 
You see, you and I are called upon because the Holy Spirit of God resides in us. And it's not us, it's not ourselves that's bearing fruit. In fact, the Bible talks about being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so forth. And you have that whole list. And as we go out into the marketplace and we live out our Christianity, I'll tell you what, the world will take notice of that. You see, the Holy Spirit of God is using the church to do the will of the Father in the world in which we live. Now let's try to think this through. Is there a great event that would take the Holy Spirit out of this world? In 1 Thessalonians chapter four, Paul wrote about the event, the catching away, where Jesus Christ comes back for the church and the church goes and meets him in the air. What happens at that point is the Holy Spirit of God is in essence removed in the lives of Christians. It's not to say that he's not operating during the, the, the next, next seven years. He will be, but it's totally different. Just as it was different for the Holy Spirit and his role and work prior to the church. This is what sets the church age so much apart is the fact that we are permanently indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. As a Christian man or woman, you have the Holy Spirit of God residing in you, equipping you in an amazing, amazing way. All you need to do is read back through the whole Old Testament and you see how exceptional it was to be able to be an individual who was being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And here's the powerful church. My friends, the church is not weak. All of these things that are rising up, all of the mystery of lawlessness that's going on, never forget the fact that the church is not weak. The church is powerful, and our impact on this world is being felt every single day. You say, Pastor Kevin, it is getting nasty out there, and you're right, but you have no idea about what this would look like, and I don't have any idea either. We have no idea what this world's going to look like when we Christians are gone. And the world plunges headlong into a sinful pursuit. Nothing to restrain it anymore. Go. And that event will take place. Notice with me here, as I just wanted to pull this together. I told you two weeks ago that I was going to do this. If you look here in verse 3, it says, Let no one deceive you, for it will not come unless, here's two things, the apostasy comes first. And we said that that, I said that that was a departure, a reference to the rapture, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. When you come to verse 7, it says the mystery of lawlessness is at work, only that he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And verse 8, then that lawless one will be revealed. And so in verses 7 and 8, you have this one who's taken out of the way. Consequently, the lawless one is revealed. Same thing's happening in verse 3 where you have this departure and then the man of lawlessness is revealed. And so again, I believe that they are one and the same. This is a reference here to the rapture of the church. You and I are called upon to be salt and light as long as we're here. And the neat thing is you will be. You will be. You will be salt and light holding back this mystery of lawlessness until Christ says, okay, it's time. And Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds for us. And we as the church will go and meet our Savior in the air. What joy and what blessing. What blessing. As I look around, I see things happening that I've never seen before. Uh, there's a change in the way people think. There is a cultural revolution that's going on, but it transcends the United States of America. This is a global change that's occurring. But it's wonderful to be a Christian, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing to know the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him. Never give up. Never give up. Don't lose heart uh, because we know that God is in control, that God has a plan and all of these things that we're seeing are a part of his overall plan. This is an exciting time to live. It really is. It seems like every day my rapture meter goes up. My rapture meter is my potential for being raptured in my life. I'm 58 years old. And so I'm looking at that going, all right. <laughs> if I was 80 years old, I'd be optimistic. <laughs> Let's pray. God, we just give you thanks this morning. We give you thanks for your love to us and the encouragement that we get from your word. Uh, Lord, help us to be willing to take the stand for righteousness. 
to the day we're called home. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to share the love of Christ with whoever will listen. And help us, Father, to live out our faith even though it's difficult and challenging. May we truly be men and women who are convicted of our beliefs and faithful to you. Lord, it's just a true comfort to know that you're in control of all things. And Lord, you know the end from the beginning and we don't. So we pray that we would be faithful. Give us an awesome week, Lord, where we glorify you as we just walk each and every day. May we bear much fruit for your honor and glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray it, amen.